Jussel for the Antiques Roadshow. This week we're in Chicago searching for hidden treasures from attics and living rooms all around the area. We never know what we're going to see come through the door. It's the Antiques Roadshow from Chicago. Stay tuned. <laughs> Antiques Roadshow is made possible by the Chubb Group of Insurance Companies, who, along with 3,000 independent agents and brokers, can insure your world. And by the annual financial support from viewers like you. Chicago is, for most visitors from around the nation and abroad, the quintessential American city. The name Chicago itself comes from an old Indian word meaning place of onion grass or skunkweed. In 1673, Father Jacques Marquette and Canadian-born explorer Louis Joliet found the spot where Indians portaged their canoes from the lake to a river later called the Des Plaines. But Joliet predicted a great future for Chicago. If a ditch could be dug to connect the lake to the river that joined the Mississippi, they'd have the link to the Gulf of Mexico. But as late as 1830, it was still a small, insect-ridden fur trading post and yet, 63 years later, it was one of the most modern cities in the world with well over a million inhabitants and host to a great World's Fair. Here we are at the Odium Sports and Expo Center in Villa Park, about 20 miles west of the city. Inside, our experts have already set up and they're ready to look at hundreds of antiques brought in by people from all around the Chicago area. With us today, as always, are specialists from the great auction houses on both coasts. They are joined by some of the country's best independent auctioneers, dealers, and appraisers who have come from near and far to be with us here today. Now, here's our first appraisal. You bought one of my personal favorite toys. I want you to tell me what you know about it. Well. The only thing I do know is it was handed down from family to family. I don't know whether it came from my grandmother or her mother before, and that would all be in Chicago. Do you remember playing with this as a child? No. Do you know where it was made or anything like that? I don't know anything. That's why I was so tickled to have this opportunity to bring it here. Well, it's a real treasure, and uh, you couldn't have brought it to a more appreciative audience than to me. I have one or two of these in my own collection. Of just like toys. this? Just Almost just like really? this. Really? And this was the first and best American kaleidoscope. Oh, really? Uh, oh. It's made by a company called Bush. It was made in Providence, Rhode Island in the 1870s. Oh, really? You can actually see on the, uh, on the top here, although there's a little corrosion in the metal, you'll see bush, you'll even see there's a little emblem of a kaleidoscope. Oh, really? And, then, and it has a patented reissue date of 1873, I, I think I discerned. Well, my grandmother was born in 1875, so then that would predate my grandmother. Maybe then. it was given to her perhaps as a, as a child. Uh, Maybe. Although Maybe. it wasn't really a children's toy. This was almost uh, a scientific wonder of its uh -huh. age. Uh, this example is really a fine example. It's got some condition problems which affect its value. I'll tell you one thing you probably don't know that's missing. No. There's a little hole right here. I saw that. In the stem. Yes, I saw that. Often, the stem breaks because of that hole. But what belongs in that hole is a wire, and this could be easily fabricated. It goes down here and bends up, and you put a candle on that wire. Oh, for heaven's sake. So that oh, is my actually goodness provides sake. the illumination. Oh, that's, that is fascinating. Now, what makes this kaleidoscope just so fantastic and head and shoulders over anything else are the are the objects, as you well know, that you see when you look at it. Oh, I'd love to look at it. When you look inside and turn it, you get the typical kaleidoscope effect, but uh, instead of bits of pieces of colored glass, what you have in here are hand-twisted glass rods, twisted like Venetian glass. You have little ampules of a colored oil so that 
the, the liquid actually moves in the ampules and provides additional color. And it really, it's oh, just you have, absolutely amazing. You have explained this so beautifully with the ampules and the oil. And I, uh, I've never heard it explained like that. As far as value is concerned, as I said, this is a good example, but it has some wear. One very good thing, often these things are missing, which are very hard to replace, so you have all them. It could be tightened up, the screws tightened up, so it's a little, and I would advise doing this. In this condition, I would say this kaleidoscope is worth around $1,500. Oh, that is wonderful. <laughs> that is wonderful to hear. So you really have quite oh, a treasure. Very thank good. Thank you. I got the watch from my husband's grandfather after he passed away. He, uh, he came from where? He came Glasgow, from Glasgow, Scotland. Scotland. Mm -hmm. And what was it that he did? He was a... He worked on watches as he a was side a watchmaker. Line. And, and clocks also. So clocks. he probably got this watch many, many years ago. He died when? 19? Back in the early 60s. Early 60s. Mm -hmm. So he might have had this watch early, as early as the turn of the century. Right. But um, in fact, this is actually much earlier than the turn of the century. Um, and like many early watches, it's fun to go exploring. Now, this watch was a bunch of a precision instrument, so they would have protected it with an outer case. So the first thing you do to look at this thing is to pick up the case and open it. Fingernails help. It opens up and then the whole watch actually comes out of the case. And we can leave this part right here. Now the curious thing about this is that the case is round, but the watch is oval. Now, watches when they were first made weren't worn in pockets. Do you know why that is? No. Well, people didn't have pockets. Oh. <laughs> and this probably was worn as a pendant. And whenever somebody worked on a watch, they would leave their calling card inside. So very often you can tell the history of a watch by opening up the case and taking out the papers that you see inside the watch. And if we're lucky, we will find out something about the watch. And these things tend to stick a bit. There we go. And not only did this cloth inside the watch keep it from rattling around and protected it, but sometimes it was used as advertising. Whatever is in this watch doesn't tell us much about the person who owned it, except this has to do with um, the Catholic Church. Now, you told me something else about the watch. Uh, my husband's elderly cousin had told me that the watch came from a cardinal of the church. came from a cardinal of the church. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense because when watches like this were made, only the very, very educated people would have wanted to own it. So let's take a look at this watch. Now I think it's quite different from the kind of watch that we're used to seeing today. You'll see that it has lots and lots of dials. If we look at the top of the watch, we can see here not something that tells us the time, it's a calendar. And it's engraved with the signs of the zodiac. If we look down here, actually, there is the time. Unfortunately, it's missing its hand. But when it was new, it probably only had one hand, so we haven't really lost very much. Over here, we see a little aperture, and that tells us the day of the week. Over here, you'll see the phases of the moon, a little aperture, and just so you don't miss anything, you see the little angels engraved on it to show you where to look. Now, let's open it up. And we look at the inside of it, and we'll see that the watchmaker has signed it. His name was Edmund Gilpin, and he was working in London. Do you have any idea of its age? I think you do. In the 1600s. Right, in the 1600s. This is what a watch would look like if it was made in about 16, what we say 1640. Um, and it's an English watch. At that time, the English were making very, very few watches. Over the years, it's been changed a little bit, but really very, very few watches of this type survive. I never expected to see anything like this when I came here. And in fact, I didn't even bring my book of early English clockmakers. So I can't tell you Mr. Gilpin's dates, but I can tell you he was working probably in the first half of the 17th century. Um, the other thing I can tell you is, is that when I first saw this watch, I had to contain my excitement. Um, in the years that I've been doing this, about 20, 
Um, I have seen a handful of these watches. Um, it's an English calendar watch in an oval case, very plain, um, extremely rare. Only a handful of these survive. Most of them are in museums. And if I were to put on my thinking cap to say, well, what, what is this watch worth? I might say I'm not really sure. But if I wanted to hazard a guess, maybe $15,000? Wow. <laughs> maybe $20,000? Wow. <laughs> um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I've only sold a couple of these in my life, and with the family history, I think it makes it just that much more special. Mm -hmm. And I'm just delighted to have seen it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, thanks for coming in today. Thank you. you brought us a wonderful object here. Tell me a little bit about how this came to be in your possession. Well, probably somewhere between 15 and 20 years ago, I went to a house sale, and this baseball was in the in the box, and it had all these uh, wonderful signatures on it. But what intrigued me was it was from a girls' league, so I bought it for probably a quarter. Wow! Took it home, put it in a drawer, and when the uh, movie A League of Their Own came out, I said, "Where is that baseball?" <laughs> and I went and dug it out, and sure enough. It's from the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. Your story is just absolutely wonderful about it. Um, you have, of course, as you say, a signed baseball from the official Professional Girls League, um, and it's signed from the team in the year 1950, and then everyone who was on the team as well. Um, you have the wonderful signatures here of, of some of the great stars, Beverly Hatzell. Um, I love this signature that you showed me before, uh, Mummy Derringer. Right. Um, it's it's a great um, signature, and they just have terrific names. Um, you know, when you think of sports memorabilia, 90% of the market is, of course, baseball. But it's all Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig mm -hmm. and all the great stars that we know who are men. Um, and this is this is terrific. Do you um, have any idea? Did you try to find out what this was worth? I've been to uh, some of the sports memorabilia shows, and they look at it, and then they, they can't give me any idea because they've never seen one either. Well, <laughs> certainly the women's leagues were a very important event in baseball, um, hotly contested, as you would imagine, by the men um, to have them enter. And and um, they often started by hitting to the minor league teams as well, mm -hmm. um, pitching for them. Um, I have only actually seen a ball like this come up once before at auction. And it was not as good as this. It was, in fact, shellacked. Um, very often, balls have a yellowish appearance mm -hmm. to them. And that's because the balls were shellacked. And the shellac actually, over time, pulls the um, the different signatures autographs and signatures off oh. onto the varnish and they in fact begin to discolor tremendously and so this would be in really really very very nice shape with all the anecdotes and uh, all the signatures on them do you yourself have any idea of what it might be worth i have no idea well i, I have to say I, I think you did a little better than a quarter okay. um i the ball that was sold at auction about three years ago um, had a pre-sale estimate of two to three thousand dollars. Oh on my it, God! <laughs> and it actually sold for four thousand two hundred dollars. Oh, so astounding. you have um, a very rare collectible oh, here, my God. and um, I, something that certainly is very valuable and something well, that's going worth holding on to. Thank, Thank you, you very much. caught my attention because the the dragon here on the outside but I want to hear about where you got it okay um, I grew up in a town called Eden in Western New York and my mother was an antique hound and she bought it at a small antique dealer that she was friends with in that town yeah and you were with her you said yes or? I was uh, it was probably about 1970 1971 and I was uh, a kid and I used to go with her and I went with her when she bought this oh, good. piece and he is a friend of the family or something yeah or? she was she, she it was, was a woman, uh -huh. and yeah, she had been friends with my mother, and she would call her every once in a while when and she, she would get a, get a unique thing. piece in. What did she tell you about this? You know, my mother didn't know too much about it. Um, really, 
don't know much at all. I mean, she told us it was old, um, mm -hmm. wasn't even sure if it was Chinese or Japanese. Um, mm -hmm. But my mother, it was one of her favorite priests, and she was always trying to find out information on it, but never really got too far with it, which uh -huh. is why I brought it here today. Oh, good. Well, let me, t let me tell you what I can about it, all right? Uh, as I said, one of the things that caught my attention was the dragon, which mm -hmm. most people associate instantly with Chinese or Japanese mm -hmm. art. And the interesting thing about the dragons is that if you look here, you'll see that the claw on the dragon has five claws. Okay. And there's often you hear the mythology about a uh, five-claw dragon denotes that the object was made for imperial use for the imperial household. Ooh, interesting. And if you had four claws, that means it wasn't. Mm -hmm. But this happens to have five claws. This is getting interesting. And then the other thing that's sort of nice about it is you look here and you see the uh, scrolling vine work, mm -hmm. and the, which is a lotus design, and mm -hmm. you often find this on 18th century um, carved ivory and uh, lacquer objects. And so you find that on this. The shape is also an 18th century shape. Um, more or less, it's sort of a cylindrical form. Uh, you do find this at later periods of time. And if you look at it on the surface, the, the carving looks pretty good and um, you just get a pretty good feeling about it. Uh, had you had any idea about the value of it, or what did she pay for it? Um, she paid, I believe it was probably about 125 or $150 at uh -huh. that time. And I guess I sort of thought maybe between $500 and $1,000. Uh-huh. Well, as you, as you look at it, uh, as one looks at it more and more, um, first notice the things that we've talked about, but then you start to look again up here at the top, and as ivory, ivory always has sort of a grain to it. Okay. It's like a tree ring. Mm -hmm. And you see little lines. And if you look on this, you'll notice that there isn't any tree rings. And in fact, what we've got is a piece of plastic. Is it really? It's plastic. <laughs> That's funny. And it has, it has a value of probably not more than about 5 or $10. Which is a great shame. Well, I guess that antique dealer didn't pan, pass on such a great find, did she? <laughs> adds to the story, so that's good. You were telling me it came out of your mother's estate. Could you tell me a little more about that? She died at the age of 99 wow. years and nine months old. We uh, decided that we would sell the house, and the house was full of things such as this, all antique. This rifle was found in the back of the storage closet. Well, that's, that's a very interesting story because of this pattern of rifle today in the collecting world, in the institutions that we know of, there's probably three, this being the fourth one to turn up from this presentation. And I have a lot of great information for you. In fact, I had one of the other presentation rifles for the same incident, so we're very familiar with them. This pattern of rifle is called the Hall Flintlock Rifle, and they became used by the regular army as early as the 1820s and into 1830s. They were a breech loading mechanism where this device down here actually releases this breech here, which pulls up, and you could load the rifle from the back, as opposed to most of our earlier rifles that were muzzle loaders. Later on, this rifle gets adapted from flintlock to percussion. This is still in flintlock, which is the earlier mechanism. There was originally a screw that came up here and held a piece of stone in here that fired as you pulled this back into this position and put what's called the frizzen down. It hit against that, dropping a spark into this breech block, which ignited the barrel. It's a single shotgun, but being a breech loader could be very quickly loaded without having to stand up to ram the ball down and load it each right, time. Right. Now, what happened is this plaque down here is what's of the greatest of significance. This gun actually involves an incident that happened during the War of 1812 in Plattsburgh, New York. And when the British, of course, were trying to take New York State again, and the city of Plattsburgh was very significant at that point, a lot of the troops from that area had left the area to engage the British in other parts of the war. 
When the British decided to ascend on the city of Plattsburgh, most of the troops being gone, one of the local captains of the militia trying to defend the city from the British went to a schoolhouse and was able to take a lot of the boys who were 14 and 15 years old out as the British trying to cross a bridge and come into the city. They were able to hold the British at bay on the other side of the bridge and keep them from crossing the bridge. Now, if you think about it, the British soldiers at this point in time, fresh from the Napoleonic War, were some of the most hardened, battle-hardened soldiers you could have to fight up against. In, practice, in fact, I, I can't think of a worse enemy to have at that point in time. And here's some young schoolboys, 14 and 15 years old, saving the city from the British Army coming in on the other side. They were successful. So successful successful that the captain of the local militia told each one of the boys, I will make sure that Congress presents each one of you with a rifle. He pursued this. But unfortunately, with the paperwork with Congress and so forth, it took Congress over 20 years to finally approve the purchase and presentation of these rifles. Now this gun, if we look at the plaque back here, it says, by resolve of Congress, presented to Ethan Everest, to his gallantry during the siege of Plattsburgh. Also, there's a plaque back here, which if we turn the rifle, and this plaque has EE, which refers to Ethan Everest, and then it says September 11th, 1814, which is the date of the incident of the siege of Plattsburgh. If we look a little farther up, right here is Hall, and Hall was the designer of this rifle. So when they were presented these rifles, this would have been the most efficient, military weapon of the period. But bear in mind, these boys at this point in time would have probably been in their 30s, mid-30s, and um, this would have been a weapon, a, more of a military uh, assault weapon, more so than it would have been a hunting weapon due to the length. Today's market value on this gun would be about thirty-five to $40,000. The one I did have was in slightly nicer condition with a lot of the browning and case color, and it sold for $44,000. So it's a very important weapon you've got here. One thing I would suggest, you have a light coat of surface rust going on here from being in the closet. Put some oil on that to stop that surface rust. And really, other than that, just take care of it. I was told not to try to doctor it up in any way. Don't and clean it. it you was, never want to clean the guns. That's why but it was oil left will always way. protect the guns from any further rust. So oil is a way of stopping any potential problems that are going on, but it will not clean the gun. It was a pleasure to see the piece. It's a very yeah, important gun. Now we're with Gordon Converse, a clock dealer from just outside Philadelphia. Gordon, this is an interesting facet of the world of clock collecting. Tell us what you have here. Oh, I'd be glad to. These are dials from antique grandfather clocks, and they become popular for a lot of people to collect. People will buy them and hang them on their wall, very much the same way you would a painting. And I have also have some collectors who are clients who, who will put nine or ten on a wall together, and they, they really look great. Now, when do these date from? That's a, it's surprising to a lot of people is that these dials are indeed old. Uh, the ones you see down in this area here, these two, date to the 1820s or 30s, but this one might be a little earlier. It may yeah. be even late uh, 1700s. Really? This is the oldest of all. The, the square dial, of course, is a much earlier form of, of clock design. What do things like this cost? The interesting thing about clock dials, and one of the reasons I think that they're so popular these days with collectors, is because they, it seems to me they're inexpensive. Sometimes you can pick up a nice looking uh, clock dial for about $100. It may have some flaws, whereas others might cost up to $500 or more. I see. Uh, but always uh, count on finding out what sort of restorations there have been done and how old the dial is before you buy. I think yeah. that's a good idea. Thanks, Gordon. Now, let's go back and see some more appraisals. What have you brought us here? I've got a Revolutionary War Discharge signed by George Washington for a man named James Columbus. You certainly have. Mm -hmm. This is a genuine Washington Discharge papers with all the old tape work on the back and tears just as a veteran would have carried it around in his pocket. So many of them are damaged. This one shows 
damages. Here's Washington's signature, we see. Mm -hmm. And we've got June 1783, 1777 through June 1783. So it's now, six how years did, of service. How did you come by this? Um, actually, my mom, she found it in a black tin box after her aunt died. Mm -hmm. And she thinks it's been in her family for a long time. But not a relative, perhaps. Um, no, not a relative. Not a relative. Yeah. Well, it's the, the, these things do appear at uh, at sale, and uh, this is a beautiful example. I see you've kept it in a mylar folder, mm -hmm. and uh, I guess cool. you've prepared this catalogue entry at the back, which is great. Mm -hmm. But uh, have you uh, shown it to any friends or? Do well, you... yeah. Actually, um, one day about two years ago, we took it in for show and tell. And my mom, she really didn't know what it was worth back then, so she took it around and she passed it to all the kids and said, you're touching something George Washington touched. And here's my mom and the teacher in a big argument at how it's real or not. This was at your school? Yeah, the teacher didn't think it was real. Your teacher didn't believe this was no, real? No, she didn't believe it. Oh, I'm amazed. She thought it was a fake. Ah, no, it's as genuine as can be. Do you have any idea what it's worth? I've seen quite a few of them. Well, someone told my mom it could be worth thousands of dollars, but well, I'm Well, it really is not worth sure. some thousands of dollars, yes, and they routinely go for between six and ten thousand dollars. The condition factor dictates the demand on the day at an auction, and I'm mm -hmm. giving you an auction price now, but it's somewhere between six and ten thousand dollars on a good day. That's great. That's, you're happy with that? Yeah. It seems like you've got a little treasure in this box. So what I'd like to do is open it up, and we're going to tilt it a bit. Now, it looks like to me what we have in here are the Dion quintuplets. Am I right there? That's right. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit? It sounds like you had some uh, fun childhood play with this. Oh, yes. I got these, um, I think, around 1940. Mm -hmm. I must have been about eight. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed playing with them. For well, it doesn't seem like you play with them too often because I notice here that they all have the original clothing on. Mm -hmm. And every doll here um, has its original button, um, which is extremely rare. Of course, everybody is familiar with the Dion quintuplets. Um, these dolls were actually made after 1935, and they all have their little original name tags, as you will see here in, in the basket. Um, what I also noticed, as you pointed out to me earlier, is that underneath here, there's some additional little surprises. Can you tell me about these? What is, what is this little uh, object well, right here? That's the little party dress that they came in. Uh huh. And also under there, under the pillow, is the uh, little slip that goes under Good the go dress. <laughs> well, I have on. to say, you were obviously very meticulous um, as a child. You must have not had any uh, brothers and sisters. Is that right? That's right. I. I didn't have to share. You didn't have to share. Being well, only child. you're actually very fortunate because most of these type of dolls, at least what I've seen, have been very incomplete. Um, they usually don't have the name tags, the clothing has been torn. And I also noticed this looks like it's the original box uh, or basket. That's a, yes. uh, so you received it like this as a, as a uh, child. Yes, it was a um, Christmas present from my aunt and uncle. Oh. Mm. Well, it certainly is really quite lovely. They were made by Madame Alexander, which right. you're probably familiar mm -hmm. with, who is still making dolls today. And as I say, these were made after 1935, so 1940 would make sense. Um, as a value on these, because they're so complete and because you have the original box and all the accessories, um, I would say it's going to be worth probably at auction about $1,500 to $2,000. Wow. Wow. <laughs> does that surprise you a yes. little bit? Sure does. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what they're worth. And um, I think you should go home now and take care of them, <laughs> just as you've continued to do all these years. I understand you're a collector of this type of thing, puzzle mugs and puzzle jugs. Um, can you just tell us how long you've been collecting these? Well, I think it's 
about 25 years now that I started collecting these mugs. Okay. Well, most puzzle mugs uh, were made in Europe, either in England or some of them in France or in Holland. Um, this is an unusual one because it wasn't made there, it was made in the United States. And I think we should start just by saying what a puzzle mug is. Um, the puzzle, of course, being how do you drink out of this thing? Uh, it's pierced all the way around, it has holes in all the wrong places. So if you fill it up with, with beer, how are you going to drink out of it? That's the puzzle. Uh, have you ever tried drinking out of this one? Or? Yes, I have. And it took me a little while to learn how, but I did finally learn. All right. Now, I'm going <clears> to <throat> tell you what I think, and you tell me if I'm wrong. All right. But it seems to me that once there's some liquid in it, the only way you could get it out would be to tip it through the handle. Um, there's a hole inside, which you may be able to see, at the base of the handle. And once it's tipped in the right direction, the liquid might just come out of this hole at the top of the handle here. That's the only way I can figure it, but these things can be very puzzling and very devious, John. Am I right? Yes, uh, that's true. There are a number of different ways that puzzle marks were made and work differently. Right. Uh, anyway, that seems to be the answer to this one. Now, what I think is particularly fascinating about this puzzle mug is not the way it puzzles, but who made it and when. Um, it's made of redware, and we can tell that by looking at the body color underneath the glaze of this object. You can see it's a reddish color. And it's covered in a rich, green, lustrous glaze that is typical of American redware uh, made in the late 18th and through into the 19th century. When we see this kind of green glaze where we often think of the Shenandoah Valley, uh, parts of the Virginias, and also parts of uh, Pennsylvania even. But what we typically don't see on American redware is what your puzzle mug has. It's inscribed with someone's name, uh, perhaps a location, although it's difficult to decipher the words. It seems to be the name of a town, and most impressively, it's dated. Now, there's very little that excites collectors more than dated pieces of pottery. And when you have a dated piece of American pottery, that's even more exciting, especially when the date is as early and as interesting as this one. It's dated 1784, uh, which was a very um, tempestuous time in American history uh, on the East Coast, um, in between the Declaration of Independence, of course, uh, and the establishment of the first federal government. I'm not sure where this one was made, John. It has some references. The word Bucks is written down here, which may well be a reference to Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Well, I suspect it wasn't made there. But wherever it was made, uh, someone received it in 1784. And today, it's one of the most interesting and most valuable puzzle jugs I've seen. Um, how long ago did you buy it, may I ask? I think I bought it uh, about 25 years ago. And it was my acquisition of this particular mug that got me interested in learning something of the background of mugs and started me on my collection spree. And do you mind if I ask how much you paid for it back then? I think the time I bought it, I spent something like 35 or $40 for it. Well, I think you made a very good investment. Today, your puzzle mug um, would be worth at least $5,000 and perhaps as much as $6,000 on the open market. That does surprise me. Well, thanks for bringing it in, John. Now tell me, is it something that you bought or inherited? What's the history of the painting? Uh, this came from my father's house. Uh -huh. uh, he lived on three acres in Lombard, Illinois. Uh -huh. He had a big house, big old garage, all the way down to a chicken coop. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and he had it all filled with things. He loved to go to auctions. And so was he a, in the business? Was he a picker? No, or no, was no. He just... he just lived to be 92 and he enjoyed himself doing that. Well, everyone in the antiques business loves to hear about pickers and great uh, pack yeah. rats who never threw things away. Yeah. Well, you certainly picked a treasure from wow. the chicken coop. Oh. Um, this is a painting by Jane Peterson, who was an American Impressionist artist. Uh, she was born in New York in 1876 oh. and died in 1965. Uh, while she was born in New York, she traveled all over the country, spent a great deal of time in Gloucester, Massachusetts, and painted there quite a bit. This painting was probably done in 1924 in Constantinople. She was there, she was in Venice, she traveled all over the, all over the world. 
The issue with valuing this painting is twofold. First, there's the bad news, then I'll give you the good news. The bad news is location, location, location. Her most valuable paintings are the American Impressionist scenes in the United States, you know, great scenes of women in gardens with hollyhocks and flowers and things like that. The good news is, uh, that women artists are really being reappraised in the auction market and in the secondary market. Uh, for the longest time, they were just seen as, you know, biding time doing paintings between their father's homes to their husband's mm -hmm. homes. Uh, now they're really being seen as the fine quality artists that they are. And Jane Peterson's works have sold for over $100,000. Mm. They're tremendously valuable pieces. And this piece, uh, 1924 Constantinople, as I said, I would put a value of on eight to twelve thousand dollars. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. Oh, good. <laughs> wonderful. So go back to that chicken One coop. <laughs> We've gone to a lot of a trouble to bring in this this piece. Tell us uh, how you acquired it. Well, actually, it was at an estate sale in uh, Lake Forest, Illinois, here, and they couldn't sell it, and they couldn't sell it, and they couldn't sell it. It got down to the last 15 minutes, and the lady was desperate and said, "Will you ta will you buy it for $900?" So that's what I bought it for. $900. Yes, and I just fell in love with it. I know nothing about it, but. I love it. How long ago was this? It was only about three months ago. Yeah. The people who had it, though, had owned it, I believe, for about 20 years. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very interesting because what you've brought in is uh, a wonderful library uh, cabinet, and its inspiration comes from the Sheraton style in England. Uh -huh. You see these beautiful veneers and, and uh, high quality veneers and inlays. You see this checker stringing, an inlay that goes down the drawers. And yet it also has a Chippendale cornice and you see the blind fretwork which goes across the top here. And it's actually a style piece. It's, a, it's an Edwardian piece. Oh. Uh, so it was made probably between the, uh, around the First World War, and it's copying a very popular style that, uh, of an early 19th century form. But some pieces have a tremendous value, uh, even still, uh, because it's so decorative. And you can see the wonderful uh, proportions of the uh, arched windows and uh, the Gothic top. It really is a wonderful, compact little piece. And this is the kind of piece that actually is in demand today. So when you bought that piece for $900, did you think about it as a decorative piece or were you thinking that uh, it might be a period piece? Well, I just love antiques and um, I wanted it so badly, I told my husband I'd forego my new carpeting if he would let me have it. So <laughs> I just wanted it. It just was gorgeous. I loved the inlay and everything else. So you've, you've foregone getting carpeting in order to, have to buy right, a piece of furniture. Right, for another year in order to buy this. <laughs> Well, let me tell you something. I think probably you'll be able to get wall-to-wall -wall carpeting and maybe a little bit more because actually a piece like this just on its pure decorative value alone is worth five to seven thousand dollars. Holy man. <laughs> and oh. uh, it, it could even bring more uh, because it is such a wonderful usable piece of furniture for people to put their their books or their uh, porcelain collection that um, it could it could even go up higher than that and, and go to ten thousand dollars oh my gosh <laughs> i'm really surprised i thought maybe two thousand the way they originally wanted that amount for this no it's a wonderful wonderful piece highly decorative and i would say you should go to a good uh, carpet store and start picking out the best uh, carpeting that you can to go under it and <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> i'm keeping it <laughs> good well, congratulations <laughs> thank you it's a very piece. much Let's take a break from the floor here at the Odium Sports and Expo Center in Villa Park. Yesterday, we went with Leslie Heinemann, a Chicago auctioneer, who showed us Frank Lloyd Wright's house and studio in Oak Park. Leslie, this is this is fantastic. This is this is a temple, mm -hmm. really, to one of the great architects of America, probably mm -hmm. the greatest architect we've produced in this century. Right. It's, it's really. It's amazing it's to be here. Now, you told me earlier there's something fascinating about when this house was built and where it was. Right. Uh -huh. What was across the street? Um, actually, the prairie. And you know, he was really pretty much the founder of the Prairie School of Architecture. And he built this building at, over a course of 20 years, actually, and developed his whole school of architecture. And originally, it was just his house. And he worked from one desk, one room in the house? Pretty much. 
he built the house and started here in 1889, and he kept adding on and then finally did the studio where we are now so in 1898. How many staff did he have in here? Maybe 15 people, something like that. Now, the house has a lot of the original furniture in it. Yeah. He believed in the total concept of a home. Everything should be incorporated. He liked to use natural materials. He liked built-ins. There are a lot of built-in areas. There's a little fireplace called an ingle nook where everyone could sit and be very cozy and warm. It all works together as a unit. So this is, this is total architecture. This is total right. control by the man designing your house. Exactly. And he's then doing furniture, candlesticks, right. lamps, right. vases, exactly. everything. Exactly. Now the exciting thing, the great departure in this house from the Victorian mm -hmm. architecture mm -hmm. and interior design is light. Exactly. And you can see light from different rooms. Anywhere you are, you can see the light in another room. Well, the wonderful thing that he did that I like so much are the high windows so that it brings light into the room. Right. And yet it guarantees privacy. What a fantastic house. It really is. They've restored it completely. And it's somewhere you can come and really study Frank Lloyd Wright. We're back on the floor here at the Odeum, where Antiques Roadshow specialists have been looking at hundreds of items brought in by people from all around the Chicago area. For those of you at home, we hope to see you at a future Antiques Roadshow event when we come to your city. Now, let's look in on another appraisal. You brought us a very interesting uh, bowl, enamel bowl. Do you have any idea what it is? Origin? All I know is it was a salt pot that it um, could have been uh, Fabergé, but that was an opinion, and I liked it enough, I bought it regardless. You got good taste. Thank you. What, what we're seeing here is basically an onion design, and it's, uh, it is Russian. Okay. That part, it, it's Russian. And you have a floral design, and you have granular work right through the top here are little, little uh, gold beads. That's raised gold beads. And it was very common that Fabergé did that. And the other important part about it, how we know if it is a Fabergé or where it comes from, is by the hallmarks that are on the bottom side. I'm going to turn it over now. If you look at the mark over here, there's a slight, top of it is a slight eagle. And then you have the Fabergé mark. Now you know it's a Fabergé. <laughs> you say so. I and hope then, so. And then you have the contents mark. It's an 88. That means it's 88 parts silver. Okay. So the Russian uh, metal was either 86, 84, or 82. Okay. And, uh, or 88. And this one's 88. So okay. it's a higher content of silver than the 80, 84. Okay. Now, looking at this piece, uh, I have come to a conclusion that it's not a very old Fabergé. It's not, it's not the Carl Fabergé. His son went into the business also. The mark on the bottom is St. Petersburg. Okay. So that much we know. The other mark on the bottom is the maker's mark, which if we can look up. Once we look it up and find it, it'll give you when he worked there and tell you exactly when it was made. So there's no, it's, it, it, it's cut and dry. Okay. It's fairly new though. When I say new, it could be the turn of the century, 1900, 1910, somewhere around that. The enameling is not up to snuff. If you look at the enameling and the granulation work, is not up to snuff as a being a, a fabulous Fabergé. Okay. It's a good commercial Fabergé. Now, you, you mentioned to me before, you have two of these? That was a set. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the enamel doesn't match. No, the colors are slightly different on the white flowers. Yeah, that's very good because of the fact that when they fired these, then when they mix the enamels, they never can get them exactly the same. Now, if they if they were exactly the same, then you know it was commercially made and it could have been a fake. Okay. These are real. Oh, well, good. Yeah. And uh, roughly speaking, in today's market, a piece like this if you went out to uh, buy it, it would, should cost you somewhere in the vicinity of about three thousand so dollars. For you got, one? For one. So now nah, you like that, huh? I do. <laughs> you got a great piece. Most movie posters are folded. That's pre, I understand. Pre-1988, almost every movie poster was sent to movie theaters folded because they traveled with the film from theater to theater in between the film cans, and they would fold them. 
One of the exceptions to that was a size called 30 by 40. There, there's 30 by 40 and a bigger one called 40 by 60. These were printed on light cardboard and rolled. They were silk screened. And they were meant to be put on an easel outside the movie theater. I mean, outside in the weather. So very few survived, unless they were never used at all. So, uh, where did you find this piece? At a house sale. I, you know, I just amongst the lots of things. <laughs> okay. you know. Now, when you framed it, is, was anything covered up that you remembered? Maybe a number, like a Roman numeral or something yeah. at the bottom. There, there would most likely have been a series of numbers down here that's called the National that's Screen possible. Number. That's possible. It would have been the year, which is 1933, and then a slash and three numbers. National Screen, which distributed these posters to all the movie theaters in the United States, used to assign a, a number to every film as it came out during the course of the year. Mm -hmm. So the first film was 001, and it went up from there. So this is a 30 by 40 silk screen of Duck Soup, original from 1933. Mm -hmm. How much did you pay for this thing? Very little. How much is very the, little? Tell you the truth, I really don't remember. How much did you pay to frame it? Uh, that was pretty expensive. Yeah? That was about three fifty. Three hundred and fifty dollars This poster in an auction at one of the four or five major auction houses in New York, L.A., or London that auction movie posters would sell conservatively at fifteen thousand dollars. Okay. <laughs> really glad you brought it in. It's a masterpiece. I see you brought in a powder horn today. What can you tell us about uh, where it came from or how you uh, acquired it? This came from my husband's family. His uh, grandfather's uncle originally owned it, and who knows, we don't know who had it before that. But his grandfather was 80 when he died in 1950, so we know it goes back in the family quite a ways. So you know it's at least 50 years old or 80 yeah. years old? Yeah. Well, it's a beautiful horn, and uh, from the style and manufacture of the horn, this particular style of horn with the uh, long curved neck and the flat butt plate uh, generally dates anywhere from 1780 to 1820, 1830. So that's a very old horn. Uh, there's an interesting, a lot of interesting things about this particular horn which we find unique. Uh, one of which is this style of decoration. As you see, there's a lot of geometric designs, a lot of circles and uh, hatch marks and so forth. There's a lot of animals on there. Uh, there's nice uh, carvings of, of turtles and uh, deer and antelope. But one of the most significant uh, drawings that are on this horn are these particular stick figures astride a horse. This is a very typical uh, style of drawing that was done by the Plains Indians in the upper Missouri area, which is basically where we are today. Mm -hmm. uh, it extended through part of the Eastern Plains as well. But this particular style of drawing, if you go back and you study Plains Indian style of painting that they did on buffalo robes or winter counts, mm -hmm. many of their style of paintings, you'll find the identical style of painting to this that was done in the 1830s by the Plains Indians. And so when we look at these figures that was done uh, the, of, the, of the Native Americans and the American Indians on the horses and so forth, especially the way the deer were done with the elongated necks, the way the horses were done with the elongated necks, the tacks which were done around the neck of the horn and on the butt plate as well, uh, we attribute this horn to being Native American. And that makes it quite a bit more valuable and more rare than it would be if it was just a average horn that belonged to, you know, your average hunter somewhere mm -hmm. in Illinois. Uh, other interesting things about it is it still has its original strap. This is copper wire and it's hand formed into links and made into a chain. And then you also have this little feature here, which is called a powder measure. And that's a nice element to find with the horn because they were always made with the horn, but you don't always find them with the horn 200 years later, which yeah, we're, we're right. talking about today. So just the fact that it's all together there is, is very uh, unique in of itself. But the fact that it's got a, the original patina, no one's ever messed with it. It's got this beautiful gold orange color, makes it quite exceptional. Consequently, the value of the piece is going to have a relatively high value. A lot of times, 
horns of this nature, undecorated, are worth about 60, 70 bucks, 80 bucks. Mm -hmm. This particular horn, because of the fact that it is carved, the American Indian and the designs that are on it, we would put an appraisal of this of probably around $4,000, dollars Hey, my husband will be very pleased. <laughs> yes, thanks for bringing it in. This um, scrapbook you brought in is very interesting. I mean, other than the fact that it's a nice history of a woman's life and travel around the world, there's a letter in here which, I, quite frankly, is one of the most poignant letters I've ever read about the Titanic. Um, can you give me a history of how you obtained the letter? Well, the history that I have is my grandmother bought this scrapbook at an auction, and then when she passed on, she inherited it to me, and that's all that I actually know of it. I'd like to read this letter. It's a very sad letter, but uh, I think it's highly valuable. It's resolved, adopted by a resolution adopted by the women survivors of the SS Titanic assembled on board the SS Carpathia, April 16, 1912, the day they were saved from the Titanic. We, the lady passengers, wish to express to the captain and officers, doctors and crew of the Carpathia our grateful appreciation of their tender kindness, courtesy, and generosity. After a night of grief over the loss of fathers, husbands, sons, and brothers who in their fine gallantry and chivalry sacrificed themselves to make our escape and rescue possible, to their memory we can only make too fitting tribute. But to the Kennard offices, we wish to express our hearty gratitude to the Kennard Company record. They have added a glorious chapter. For the women survivors, Margaret Brown, Mrs. William Blanchard, Mrs. George W. Stone. This is a phenomenal letter. Um, if this is the actual letter which was written on board the Carpathia, and I have to believe it is, this letter could be worth over $5,000. Anybody who collects anything on the Titanic would just, you know, go be head over heels with it. I mean, it's, it's one of the finest source letters I've ever seen. And to make it even more interesting, the woman went the next year on the Carpathia again and took a cruise. Do you ever do any research to find out if, in fact, maybe this was a memorial cruise for survivors of the Titanic? No. I haven't. I have not. The only research I've done was actually to make sure the Titanic sank on that date and the women survivors are actually women survivors from the Titanic and two of the women survivors had maids that also survived. So the only thing I could think of was possibly one of the maids wrote it for the, the women when they were assembled on the boat. No. Well, I think probably not. I don't think the maids wrote it. I think the women who were the survivors probably got together in a cabin and appointed somebody to be the secretary and wrote that. And the three women who are the signatories were chosen to speak for everyone because at that point their grief must have been so extreme that some of the women couldn't even, you know, you know, handle the situation. That's very but, possible. I mean, taking a horrible situation, a tragedy, um, and turning into a monetary return, you know, there's there's a kind of negative aspect to it, but the reality of it is the value of this. This is at least a five thousand dollar letter. Thank you very much. John, I was immediately attracted to your sword. It's a great piece. What can you tell me about it? Well, I got the sword about 10 years ago off of a lady named B. Cole. She asked me to help her clean out her garage, which I did. She gave me the sword and 23 guns wow. and some other paraphernalia that went with it. As a, just for doing her garage. Great. Do you know much about the sword's history? No, I don't. Okay. Are you familiar with Civil War swords? No. Okay. This is a Confederate sword from the Civil War. I know that. Okay. Some neat aspects of the sword are worth reviewing. One of them is the sword, one of the neat parts about it is the fact that it's made by Thomas Leach and Company of Memphis Novelty Works. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thomas Leach was the proprietor of Memphis Novelty Works. Even if this mark was not here, there are a couple other things worth looking at on this sword that would tell us that it's a Memphis Novelty Works sword. For instance, the grip here is wood covered over with a wrap of cord with leather over top. That is distinctive to a Thomas Leach and Company sword. I see. Other aspects of the sword that tell you that it's Confederate is a single unstopped fuller running down the length of the blade. Mm -hmm. Union swords had a stop fuller that would stop in the Ricasso. The scabbard here is trimmed with what's called brass furniture. You have brass ring mounts here, a brass throat, and all the way down at the bottom here, you have a brass drag. That is distinctive to Confederate scabbards. Do you have any idea of value on this sword? None whatsoever. Do you ever have it appraised before? No. 
Nobody's ever looked at it. Okay. I've had it hanging in a room. What kind of room did you have it hanging in? Just a rec room. Okay, great. It's above bullhorns. So no one has seen this sword before? No. The no, value no. of this sword, a Thomas Leach and Company Memphis Novelty Works Confederate Cavalry Saber is around $8,000. <laughs> You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. No, I'm not kidding you. It's a great, really? yeah, really, it's a great, great sword. And I really appreciate you bringing it it's in. It's a good thing I didn't sell it in a garage sale. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I would have killed myself. Yeah. With the sword. Well, that wraps it up for this edition of Antiques Roadshow. And so, with thanks to our hosts here in Chicago, especially the people at the Odium Sports and Expo Center in Villa Park, I'm Chris Jussel saying so long for all of us on the Antiques Roadshow. This premiere edition of Antiques Roadshow will be presented again Thursday afternoon at 2. Be with us next Friday evening at 8 when Antiques Roadshow sets up shop in Seattle, Washington. Since 1908, ice dancing was introduced in 1976. We just think she's cute and adorable, and we all just kill to look like her and sing like her. <laughs> all of America's talking about Dolly. She has so much light. She projects so much love. She's so bubbly and exciting. I wouldn't miss Dolly Parton on Sunday night, no way. Dolly Sundays. Napoleon and Josephine will continue in a moment. My mother-in-law recommended Preparation H for my hemorrhoidal symptoms. Why should I listen to my mother-in-law? She's also a doctor. In a national survey, two out of three doctors named Preparation H among the hemorrhoid remedies they recommended to their patients. Doctors know best. Listen to the heartbeat. Listen to the heartbeat. Today's Chevrolet Celebrity, it has the comfort, security, and performance for people who've grown up without growing old. The heart.